introduction. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Thank you all for coming. It's a, it's a sellout audience. I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, data visualization. If I were to show you a table of numbers, it's kind of hard to figure out what's going on. <coughs> you may, after a little while, figure that salesperson B is selling a little bit less than salesperson A. Um, but if I show you the picture, then you can see the trend straight away. Um, that's what we're trying to do in visualization. We have the visual representation, but we also have the interaction. Half of the story is how do you interact with these visualizations. <coughs> then we have two kinds of visualization. We have uh, exploratory and explanatory. The first helps analysts and experts look at large new data sets, unfamiliar data sets, and figure out what's going on. And the second is when you then present your insights to a wider audience. And I'll show you some examples of both types. So let's start exploring. Uh, hierarchies are very well known. You've probably all used some kind of file explorer, like the one on the left there. This is the first of my live demos, so anything can go wrong from this point. <laughs> so on the left here, you have a classic tree view, where you can open up uh, folders and subfolders. But on the right, I have uh, what we call the information pyramids view, which is uh, something we invented uh, well, about 2002-ish, if I remember rightly. Um, oops. And I can, using uh, zooming and, and the mouse wheel and various other mouse operations, I can navigate pretty quickly. And note that these are, the two views are synchronized, so if I open up something on the left, then I'll navigate there on the right, and, and so on and so forth. But my favorite tree visualization is the hyperbolic browser. There's a wonderful name. This is what it look, looks like. It was invented actually by Romana Rao and his colleagues at uh, Xerox Park in 1994 and patented. The, the, the patent expired last year. Um, I don't know why anybody's not using it because it's a wonderful way to navigate large hierarchies. Um, the hierarchy here is just on my hard disk. It's my folders with all of my talks over the years. Um, and I can open things up like this. Uh, so if I want to focus in on 1999, I can sort of get right down and I can, just with a little flick of the wrist, I can basically skim through all of the years here. And if I see something interesting down here, then I can just sort of bring it up and with very little effort, much faster than using the standard tree view, I can navigate, explore, look through these large hierarchies. This is an example, uh, a real life use of the hyperbolic tree. This is an example of a phylogenetic tree. It's uh, the hierarchy of species of green plants. It's a huge tree, it's unbalanced. Uh, it's very, very hard to navigate in any other way, but using the hyperbolic browser, um, I'll make sure you get the slides afterwards. If you follow the link here, uh, you can try it out and you'll be able to navigate. So my second example, uh, multi-dimensional data. This is tabular data, like a spreadsheet. This is actually from the, um, the UBS bank in Switzerland. Every three years, they do a prices and earnings survey of cities around the world. This is the 2012 data. Um, there are 70 or so cities. For each city, they have a few hundred values, um, indices like net purchasing power and prices. So um, the UBS prices and, and earnings survey, um, a few hundred variables, each variable is a, is a column, and each record is a city, is a row. In the table, you can sort of see a little bit, but uh, there's an alternative. Um, this is the, the second live demo where probably things will go wrong. <laughs> see if it works. This is one of my favorite demos. Um, the software was uh, produced by a small Swiss company called MacroFocus. Uh, MacroFocus.com if you want to download the same demo and play with it yourself. Um, up in the right, we have what we call a similarity map. On the left, a geographic view of the 70 cities. And down on the bottom here, it's called a parallel coordinates view. And each city here, the one I've highlighted already in red is Vienna. So Vienna, in terms of net purchasing power on this axis here, each, each variable is a, a vertical parallel line. And Vienna sort of in net purchasing power, a little bit above average, sort of average, I could turn on the mean line, would be somewhere in the middle. Um, let me do a little bit of filtering here. A cool place to live. I want my net purchasing power to be pretty high, so I'll 
get rid of all of the places that have fairly low net purchasing power. Um, working time, uh, that's Peter. Uh, that's me fairly low, so take that down a little. Vacation, paid working days per year. I think we want to be high. <laughs> Uh, you can see we're left with the, the cities that are left, we all seem to be in Europe, so we're obviously in the right place. <laughs> uh, and over here you can see that the cities are left, cities with similar characteristics in a similarity map are placed close together. Uh, if they're more different, then they're placed further apart, and there are, you sometimes see outliers like, uh, this is Caracas right over here. So this is an alternative way of looking at very high dimensional uh, data with lots of variables. That example is a little bit of a toy example. This is a real life example, a project that we've just finished with AVR Racing. They do um, high performance race cars and tuning of, of these cars. And they run simulations. They have 10 or 12 input variables. They have three or 400 output variables or parameters. They run these simulations tens of thousands of times, so they have thousands or tens of thousands of records. And in the middle there, you see the, the parallel coordinates view, which helps their engineers sort of pick some of the optimum combinations of variables to tune the race cars. This is a combination of hierarchy and what we call a, a Voronoi hierarchy. Let me attempt to show this too. The original data set uh, in the screenshot is from the uh, Süddeutsche Zeitung, the German newspaper. They have about a million articles when we did the project, I think it was 2002. Um, so think of PDFs or text documents, each one is a newspaper article. And the editors of the newspaper carefully organized them into a hierarchy according to topic. Uh, so each white dot, so this is a different data set, I don't, I don't have the original data set anymore. Uh, but each white dot represents a document and they're organized in a hierarchy. So again, you can. This is actually the um, the Mozilla Open Directory structure, and this is the uh, the subsection of computers. So each white dot is a text, a few paragraphs about a website in this particular dataset. But I can navigate over here. I can open up um, folders and subfolders. But over here now, I also see the layouts, and each polygon represents a folder. So there's one a big one here on hardware and. The documents are clustered like the cities were, so similar documents form clusters and you can uh, zoom in on them. So let me have a closer look at hardware here and I'll open it up. And then it reveals its inner structure and I can see there's a collection here on embedded retailers. So I'll go in there and I can, uh, this one here, and I can open up its inner structure. And at some point I get to the individual documents and then I can uh, open them up. So another example of using in, in larger data sets that you might not be very familiar with, using a combination here of hierarchy view and similarity map. The other main purpose is to explain. So once an analyst or researcher has looked at their large data set and they've sort of figured out what they want to say, um, they can use visualizations to help say. And I have a few examples here. The New York Times has been doing some really, really good infographics and interactive visualizations for many years now. This is also a Voronoi tree map. They came up with a better name for it than we, than we did. Um, so that's the name that is now stuck for this kind of visualization. Let me go there. Okay. Um, but they're telling a story now. So it's not as highly interactive as the Voronoi subdivision recursive stuff that I just showed you. Um, but it's slightly interactive. I can sort of zoom in a little bit. Nothing is dynamically changing apart from the zooming, and I can move around a little bit here. The data is uh, the proportion of an American spending what they spend, what proportion of their income on. Um, they're helping to tell the story with these callouts and the labeling. So in the printed version of the newspaper, they just have a static graphic. But online on the website, you have a slightly more interactive version. Uh, another example here from Bloomberg. Again, for presentation, for, for explanatory visualizations, we're often telling a story. Uh, this is a, a story about 
why we, the, world, the world is getting warmer. And you can step through, and this is the observed temperature over many decades. And they've attributed the various factors, um, or potential factors, and they've figured out the temperature change that are due to these various factors. And you can see here, I'm stepping through the story, and at each step along the way, they're giving me another potential reason for the warming and how much that factor has contributed. And they combine those three, but they don't have much uh, deforestation. Doesn't actually, if you separate it out, um, have that much effect, at least according to the Bloomberg analysis here. And aerosols actually have a positive effect in terms of lowering the temperature, at least certain ones. But here we go, these are the greenhouse gases. And if they take the combination of the greenhouse gases and uh, all of the human factors here, the land use, ozone, aerosols, and greenhouse gases, they all combine to sort of cancel each other out, and they're the ones that are actually causing, again, according to this analysis, um, and one more, the, the warming of the earth. So this is a combination of all factors. And then at the end, after having told their story, they let you play. So now you can look individually at the, at the individual factors. A uh, similar example from the New York Times, again, this is jobless data, and so they have these uh, for the US, and it's not current, it's um, let me see, 2008, 2009, but they're trying to, to help people to tell a story, they have, they have a certain angle on the story, but they want you to be able to explore as well, so you can, the overall employment rate for the 12 months ending September 2009 is 8.6% on average. Um, but now I can start to, to play around, right? So if I happen to be a, a, a black American, you see it jumps up immediately to 13.9%, right? Um, if I'm male, it jumps up again, right? So if I'm a black American male age 15 to 24, you're up to 30.5, right? And if you don't have a, um, a school degree, you're up to almost 50%, right? And that's now telling its own story again in a different way, right? And letting the user explore and, and find their own insights, as well as the angle that the, the newspaper wants to promote. Um, we're taking, we have a project right now with the uh, local government of Zurich called the Steirische Vielfalt Visualisierung. Uh, in English, the Styrian Diversity Visualization. Um, I'd like to show you live, but it was broken when I tried it earlier this morning. I will try. Uh, in a moment, but let me just explain anyway. <coughs> um, we have a lot of demographic and statistical data available, and it's way too much data to fit inside the web app. It's probably 10, 20 megs for the whole data set. And that's too big, you can't transfer that from, the, from a server inside the app and keep it in there and just display what you want. So we have to separate the data away, and it's on a separate data server, which is the one that was broken earlier today. Um, but then, we're, we're, for the user interface, we're also taking the same approach like in the unemployment uh, example previously. So, as you set the filters here, uh, I can choose my place of residence, I can say my male or female, age range or whatever. Then the data over here gets more and more precise. So we filter it out, we fetch it from the, from the server, and make the map more and more customized to whatever filters you've set. This is the one that might not work. If it stays blank here, it's broken. Yeah, it's definitely broken. So, sorry about that. So, in conclusion, uh, data visualizations help us explore and explain. If you'd like to know more, I recommend you have a look at my information visualization course notes. Uh, a couple of hundred pages PDF, free to download. And Ted, uh, the Ted 2006 was when, I heard about TED around 2000, so a long time ago, but at 2006, the TED conference, Hans Rosling, who's one of my heroes, gave this wonderful talk on information visualization. Some of you may have seen it. For those of you that haven't, go to the, the TED site and, and watch it, and all of the, the other Hans Rosling videos. I'll just share the references here so that they're captured on video for archive purposes. And 
and they're my contact details. Thank you very much.